is Erin uh, Flinchma. She's with the uh, BRIT, the uh, Botanical Research Institute of Texas that is right here in the Fort Worth. And to my surprise, they have gone historically, they've always been uh, pressing and gathering native plants of Texas for years, and but they never had a seed bank. And it's all of a sudden here, December 2019, they're going to have to preserve the plants, but getting us seeds and save all the seeds. And she helped create and found and is gathering uh, seeds of native plants and storing them and is going to help tell us, help, help to, is she's going to tell us how they're doing it and maybe how we can also do it for our seeds in our own yard. So we'll have some seeds to plant next year. So get the full story. Here is a Brit, a Brit, a Aaron Flintsbaugh. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so I started with Brit in the summer of 2019 as a, an intern. It was right as we were starting to gear up to open the seed bank. Um, and so I think I kind of hit it at a really wonderful place because I've been able to be involved with it um, from the get go. So just to start us off, are. Um, so as Jim said, we've been across the parking lot from each other, but you guys may not know what BRIT is. So BRIT actually was founded in 1987, originally because the SMU herbarium could no longer hold their specimen collections. So when we think about an herbarium, what we generally think of is we think of a sheet that has a plant that has been pressed and dried that then can be used for research. Um, and so when SMU couldn't handle their own, or I guess couldn't keep their own collection anymore due to funding, BRIT was founded. Um, over the years, we've taken on quite a few other collections. We now have the LSU collection. Um, we have quite a few collections from our actual researchers as they go out and do their research. They collect specimens that they bring back. Um, these can be used for all sorts of things. These can be used for taxonomists to decide if they found a new species. These can be used for people studying phenology to see if things are shifting or changing from year to year. Um, for me personally, whenever I'm working on a species, the first thing I do is I go down to the herbarium and I look at the species that I want. And then I look at species that are close to it and I make sure that I can distinguish what I'm looking for when I'm in the field. Um, as we've expanded, we now have a very large botanical library and art collection. Um, which I think a lot of people don't realize, which is pretty cool. And we also have just kind of our general research program. So we have researchers who study taxonomy. We study, have researchers who study genetics, um, phenology, all sorts of things to kind of increase our knowledge of the natural world. Um, we also, within the kind of BRIT umbrella, also have an education program. And that's focused more on like field trips and adult education, getting people engaged in conservation and in the world around them. Uh -huh. So today we're specifically looking to talk about the seed bank. So there are two major categories of seed banks. There are food security seed banks, and then there are wild collection seed banks. The Svalbard seed bank is, I think, the one that most people think of when I say I work for a seed bank. Um, and that is actually a food security seed bank. So that is looking at domesticated plants that might be food crops in the future and keeping those preserved. Um, wild seed banks are more concerned with native populations and undomesticated plants and trying to keep those safe for the future. Um, so with the Brit Conservation Seed Bank, we are a wild seed bank, which means we only collect from undomesticated plants and we try to collect from native populations that are as undisturbed as possible. Um, the overall goal though is to preserve populations in the wild. The last thing we want to do is take seeds from populations that can't handle it, that are too small, that are already really vulnerable. Um, and we would love to put ourselves out of a job. We would love for the future to be a situation where we wouldn't have to do any kind of seed banking because things would just be well preserved. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> that's not really the way it goes. We have threats like climate change, we have threats like urbanization, where we are seeing the space that these plants exist in just shrink and shrink or become unlivable, essentially, for the plants. And so what we are doing is we are taking insurance. And so there are two major types of seed collections that I do. Um, 
there's a seed rescue versus a standard seed collection. Uh, so yeah, this is prairie colon canicanum. It is a really tiny plant. Really got to get in there. Um, so with seed rescue, that's usually we have either a developer or honestly, the Texas Department of Transportation is fantastic about reaching out to us when they have a project that they think might interfere with a population of rare plants. And in those cases, we go out and we take every single seed that we can find because we want to try to have at least some record of that population on hand and at least some hope of a one day being able to restore those populations. Um, with a standard seed collection, we do not. Often I go out to do a standard seed collection, I'll evaluate the population and I'll say, nope, there's not enough plants here. I would prefer to leave these out here and hope that the population has as much chance as possible of surviving rather than taking them away from that population and ensuring that it's going to go away. Um, and so in those cases, I try to take less than 10% of available material. Um, and there's a certain number of seeds you need to get for it to be a valuable collection to research. So if you can't get enough seeds with taking less than 10%, we just don't collect. Um, yeah, so specifically we have the top corner is out with Texas Department of Transportation. That was a Dahlia River Shonii population that they were worried was going to be interfered with by one of their projects. And so we all went out and collected. Um, this was a standard collection with a species that we're working with out of Enchanted Rock, um, which is a really fun day. And then this was actually with Bill, um, where he had had a reached out to a landowner who had found a population of rare plants on his property. And we were like, we didn't even know you had these in Texas. This is fantastic. We would love to record it. And it was a big, healthy population. So we got to take some seed and Bill got to take some seed. So good day all around. So the biggest thing that we try to make sure that we're doing is we're collecting without negative impact. And so that's, as I said, taking less than 10% of seed available unless it's a seed rescue situation. So in all three of these cases, these are all populations that are relatively stable. And so we made sure to only take a very small amount of seed. Oh, come on. Okay, so once we've collected them, we actually take them into our lab for processing. So the first thing we do is we remove all of the external surfaces, all the extra chaff. Um, a lot of times when you're collecting, you get leaves and almost parts of plants. You don't wanna take too much. Um, oh, I did forget one thing on collecting without impact. We'll go back. Um, so one thing that we do to make sure that we're trying to collect without negative impact is we never take all of the seeds from one plant. We would only take a small portion of seeds from as many plants as possible. And that's twofold in that one, that makes sure that we have as much genetic diversity as possible in our collection. But that also means that we're leaving as much genetic diversity as possible out in the wild as we can. Um, that also means we have a lot of envelopes oh, with a lot of cleaning to do. Um, so we want to try to make them as small as a possible as, of a package as possible. So any external structures, any kind of fluff we get rid of, um, we do inspecting. So we do visual inspection just to see, does it look like this has actually been fertilized? Does it look like we had good seed set in this collection? Um, we've had issues with mold before where things will, I mean, it was funny with the Cascuta exaltata, which is already a parasitic plant and it had a mold that was parasitizing its seeds. And so trying to make sure that we are aware of the health of all of the seeds that are coming into our collection. Um, and then once they're all cleaned and inspected and photographed, then we put them into desiccating chambers. And so that's basically just a big cabinet where we dry things down. Um, so all of our seeds for long-term storage go into freezer at negative 20 degrees C. Um, and so we wanna make sure that they don't have too much water in them because then they will literally burst. Um, but you also want to make sure that you're not drying them down so much that they just don't survive. So we aim for between 25% and 35% relative humidity. Um, and then seeds, depending on the species, they can last as little as a couple of years. Some can't even be collected and frozen this way. Um, and up to 100 years, we have record of seeds surviving in these conditions. I have a question. Yeah. Do you want to take questions? Sure. Okay. So this is from Suzanne Tuttle on the chat. Um, Aaron, for your standard seed collection, mm -hmm. are you aiming to collect seed from every native species, even the common ones, or do you have specific collection goals? 
Yeah, so right now we're focused on um, what the Texas Department of Wildlife calls species of greatest conservation need. So if you guys are familiar with the nature serve ranking system, which is basically you have everything from a G5, which is super, super common, we're not worried about it, to a G1, which is, we're not even sure it's here. And actually we have a couple of letters below that are, we're pretty sure it's not here anymore. Um, we focus on everything three or lower. So I will opportunistically, or for project specific, I've had, um, like we're specific researchers that work at Brit want specific kinds of seeds and then I'll collect for their project, but those don't usually go through the whole storage process. Yeah, no problem. Good question. Um, so once they go in the freezer, they don't just kind of get forgotten about. We do try to monitor them as much as possible. We don't have as much monitoring going on right now as I would like, but we're getting there. Um, and so that means we take out our collections every year at first, we hope, and then every five years after that, just to see if they're still doing well. And so for that, we actually germinate them. Um, so this is our growth chamber. This is some area colon seeds. We're seeing how they're doing. Um, it can be a kind of challenging process in that, as probably many of y'all know, a lot of seeds, it's not just you put them in the dirt and they grow. You have to go through cold cycles. You have to go through different kinds of triggers to tell these seeds that they need to germinate. And so we spend as much time trying to figure out what those triggers are <laughs> as we often do actually getting them to germinate. Uh -huh. So if you want to seed bank at home, um, first of all, please only seed bank your seeds. Uh, I know that like parks and things like that, it seems like really tempting. I have to get permitting for every single seed that I collect, unless you're on private property and you have explicit permission from that landowner or it's your private property and you're giving yourself permission, um, please leave them there. Um, a lot of the things you want to think about when you're looking to store them, if you're just looking to store them for a year, you're honestly probably better off just to put them in your fridge in containers that can breathe. So we use a lot of, um, little muslin bags and things like that. Um, if you're wanting to store them for much longer term, freezing is great, but you have to get that desiccation step in. You can get silica gels pretty easily available, um, which you can use to desiccate, but you can't be quite as exact with those. Um, so yeah, not something I have honestly done as much. At the same time, I would still go through the same basic process, remove all your external structures so that they're as small as packaged as possible. If they're in any kind of fleshy fruit, you're trying to save your tomato seeds, don't store them in the fruit. That's just going to rot. They're going to mold. It's not going to be a good time. Um, yeah. And then dry them as much as you can before storage. Come on, Fran. So some seeds can't be banked. I think the most well-known we call, um, sorry, some seeds can't be banked through orthodox collection, which is what we've talked about here, where you take them, you clean them, you dry them, you put them in a freezer. Um, the most well-known are probably the entire oak genus. Acorns just refuse to be preserved in this way. And so that we then look at other forms of preservation. Uh, it's what makes arboretum so, so important because they can then keep those kinds of species that are not down for it. Um, some people will do rhizomal storage where you actually take a part of the root and you hold those in storage. In general, those don't store as well for as long. Um, I know people who have had them where they go from having 50 to 60 of them to less than 10 in it within five years because they just don't tend to survive as well. Um, and that is not something that we're looking at at this point. At this point, we're really only focused on orthodox seed collection and preservation. Um, so if you would like to get involved, there are several ways you can. The probably easiest that you guys might already know about is iNaturalist. So iNaturalist is a fantastic tool for me personally, because it, and as Bill said, that's how he found that population um, that we weren't expecting to find. I check constantly. That's one of the first places I go when I start working with a species is I see where is it? It's useful for phenology. It's useful for direct location. It can be even really great for just like building up contacts. Sometimes it's really hard to get in contact with private landowners, but if there's someone who's worked with iNaturalist that I can message back and forth with, it becomes a lot easier. Um, if you think you have found a population of rare plants and you're interested in letting us find it, but you don't want to put it on iNaturalist for whatever reason, you can always contact us directly. We love getting those emails of I think I found something really cool. I think you found something really cool too. I love it. It's great. 
Um, we do are starting to accept volunteers back into the C lab. Huzzah! So as you guys are going in person, we're starting to go in person too. Um, so in general, seed processing is not a very expensive thing, but it is a very labor intensive thing, the time to clean and store seeds. It's a lot, a lot of hours. And so we really appreciate people who are happy to come in and clean. I will say it's a tedious process, but if you're someone who likes like knitting or cross stitch or those kinds of things, it speaks really well to that kind of mentality. Um, and then we are also going to be having, oh, becoming a member at Brit that always contributes directly to the salaries and the people that make it keep it going. Um, and then also in August, we are going to be holding the Texas Plant Conservation Conference at Brit this year. Um, and we will have a full seed banking workshop, which will be hands-on if you guys want to attend. Oh, so do you guys have any questions? Um, so there's me, that is Erin Flinchbaugh, and then our director of conservation, Brooke Best, if you have any questions going forward. Yeah, what's up, Bill? I have not. I have moved it fully to storage at this point. Have you? Oh, sorry. Bill had asked the Penstem and Grandiflora that we had collected last year. He had asked if I had attempted to germinate it yet, um, and I have not. I have put it into storage. No, there's another one in the population. I saw that uh, Bill also asked if I had seen that there was another population found in Texas, and I had seen that email. So I think I sent them on to you because I thought you, he was the person who had contacted us was really interested in growing them. So. And such a developer for projects that work. Mm -hmm. They just bought the property where they didn't just buy it, but they're the ones grading the property up. So we're grading the H20. Um, when I went out there, they they preserved a lot of the architecture, the historic architecture out there. But when I asked about plants, they were like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we just things like that. I also wondered like how do you build the these yeah, so the question was, how do we get kind of more involved with developers? And the hard thing is, we honestly don't have a lot of leverage. Um, even endangered plants receive no federal protection on private property. So even if I tell them that there is a plant there that I would really like to come collect, if they want to bulldoze it, there's nothing I can do about that to a large extent. Um, in a lot of ways, we just rely on goodwill. Um, I will say we've had with the Texas Department of Transportation, they're fantastic. I've gone out and done seed collection with them half a dozen times at this point with different projects. Um, and they're really good about doing the surveys ahead of time with private developers. I've honestly only had one at this point who's reached out and it was like less than a month before breaking ground. And in that case, it can be don't really have time to survey a lot of things aren't even going to go to seed by then um and so those situations are really tough and so it's one of those if we have people who reach out we are super happy to take that on we love to work with people as much as they're down um but i i don't have leverage <laughs> they reached out like the sport society was offered to be able to save like barn and then yeah yeah, no, and I will say we have had projects in the past where we've had people to reach out to do surveys and then we give them the data and then they're like, great, walk away. <laughs> um, and that can be some of the roughest because it's so much of your labor and so much invested. Um, but at the end of the day, that's it's private property. That's the way it works in Texas. And I say in this job, you meet so many landowners who are so fantastic and so excited to find your plants on their property and want you to come out and want you to survey. But it is a double sided coin. Yeah. 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 Do you guys have any um, plans or anything for collecting any things from the ash tree? Like the headquarters coming? Um, so the question was if we had any plans to collect any seeds from ash trees. Um, I do not. Okay, do you know about the ash borer? No, I don't. Well, it has decimated the ash trees up in uh, the northern part of the United States. Okay. And it killed basically the whole population in the snow in Texas. Mm, okay. And so the forecast is that it will wipe out all of the ash trees. Oh my goodness, that's really good to know about. Um, yeah. 
Uh, it's honestly something we haven't looked into at this point. Generally, we go based off of that SGCN list that TPWD puts out. And so if it's not on their radar, it's often not on our radar yet. Are you are you keeping up with the number of requests or leads you get on these or do you have a backlog? Or yeah, in general, we keep up pretty well with the requests. Um, I would say we always have a backlog of seed cleaning, um, but in general, that's where I put my priority time. If I can go out and I can survey or I can go out and I can collect, that is what I'm always gonna try to do first. I ignore all of my other paperwork to collect when I can. So you're collecting seeds throughout Texas, not just North Texas? Yeah, so the way my budgeting works in general, if it is just a straight seed collection, I'm more focused in North Central Texas. Um, if I have really great opportunities or with our other projects, like right now I'm contracted through TPWD. Um, actually the majority of my job hours is spent in East Texas looking for historic populations. Um, and that's a really, really fun time. And we do opportunistic collection with those. So I have pretty blanket permitting from Texas Department of Transportation to do collecting there. And then if I'm on any kind of private property, um, I can often get permission to collect, so. I'm actually really excited. I'm going to do something. How many plants that you've got? Oh, I don't know number of plants. That's a good one. I don't know mother lines. I have um, 29 species and I have about 42 collections, but I don't know number of mother lines. My goal, if I can, if the population is large enough, I try to collect from 50 mother lines. Um, they say if you have more than that, you generally don't. Um, it's just a lot of time. <clears throat> But I would not say I have that for every single collection. So, who's counting? Yeah, I have a spreadsheet, but I've never been asked that one. Yeah. What is the historic plant, and what historic plants are you looking for in these next? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, so it's more historic sites than historic plants. Um, so basically the Texas Department of Transportation has this massive database, the TXNDD, um, where they keep track of every single species. And so we've been given everything east of I-35 um, and north of I-10 that hasn't been like re-seen in at least 30 years in their collection. And so we're going back, we've been given those records and we're trying to figure out a lot of it is a lot of like, so they said it was near this and this. And then, so now what area do I actually need to search to try to see if we can get better GPS location? Some of them you go out and it's like, well, this is a high school football field. So no, but some of them it's great. You go out and you can use that locality information and try to figure out exactly where those plants once were. And it's a lot of fun when you win. Yeah. So when you go out and you're surveying, do mm -hmm. you actually mark the plants? Because you're not going to be able to collect seed maybe when they're blooming. Yeah. Do you actually mark them or put a survey marker in or like that? Depends on where we are. I always mark them with a GPS and every single plant I'll do usually the whole population I try to mark. And then I try to mark when I'm actually collecting seed, which plants I'm taking from. Um, and then... If it's a property where I don't think the flags are going to attract people over to it, I will put in flags that have a little green flag that let me know that's exactly where the plant was. And that can be super, super helpful finding these later in seed because they're not, it's not bright yellow or bright purple anymore. It's brown or gray and it's blending into the limestone. Um, but if it's somewhere where it's really close to a trail and I think it's going to get a lot of people stomping on it, I try not to flag. I try to just remember where it is as well as I can. Yeah. Then the species, is that on the website or where would you go to find that list of G1 and G3 species? Oh, so that is with the Texas um, Parks and Wildlife. They have a whole, it's a spreadsheet you can download. Yay. Got questions and yeah. comments um, from Suzanne Tuttle, Emerald Ash, or mm -hmm. um, she's just letting you know that that's the name of the. Yeah. And then from Erica Chaco, you said you have 29 species. Is that all? Britt has way more than that. Did you mean 29 species of native plants in our area only? Uh, 29 species of seed collection. So if you're looking at herbarium specimens, yes. We have, I think, 1.5 million specimens total, which is 
not 1.5 million species, but yeah, way, 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 way more species than that in the herbarium collection, but the actual seed collection, so species that I have seeds from is 29. Yeah, yeah no worries. Yeah, no, in herbarium specimens, yeah. A lot more than 29. <laughs> I've been collecting seeds, mm -hmm. and some of them are probably as old as three years. Mm -hmm. I use them. Year to year, but I, some I haven't used them all yet. Mm -hmm. You know, I just sealed them up in baggies. You think they're still good? Totally depends. Oh, so the question was three year old species. I mean, you don't know until you try. Um, and it's so, so species dependent. Some species can last, I mean, 80 years, just like at room temperature, which is bananas to me. And some, it's less than five. It's it's so dependent on the different species. We actually have um, a whole fridge of seeds of different grass seeds that someone did a project with almost a decade ago at this point at Brit. And we have no idea if they're good or bad. So we're gonna throw them in the back prairie now that we've earned and see what happens. Yeah. I'd say worth trying, don't throw them out, but you never know. Best case scenario, once the time to preserve the seeds is over, what is the future of this? How do you plan to reintroduce them to life, so to speak? Yeah, I mean, best case scenario, we always have some of them in the collection, either through regrowth or through um, just if they last, we hope. The, as I said, though, our goal is ultimately to have them in the wild. And just with such an uncertain future, we're still trying to figure out what that means. Should you be planting in the exact spots that those were, or if those temperatures are so much higher than that species can handle, should you be planting them further north? Are they now an invasive where you've planted them further north? That is a really, really complicated question that we're trying to figure out. And even if it's in the range that was natively that plant, you can see what you call gene swamping, where if you put something that's very genetically different into a place and then those pollinators cross pollinate, you can lose some of that original genetic diversity to this new plant that you put in. And so are you going to mess up the populations that we're doing okay, but not great? Do you just swamp them with foreign genes and take them out completely? It's, it's a lot of questions. It's a lot of questions. Yeah. So do you actually, after you germinate the plants, you grow them up and then plant them somewhere? That would be the ultimate goal. We haven't gotten to that point at this point. At this point, we haven't had anything get discrimination. Um, yes, we keep giving them to gardeners, but we're we're giving them, them to them so young and so small that I think they're picky to keep alive. Mm -hmm. I've collected some wild seed that I've germinated yeah. and produced plants with. Yeah. And now I would like to keep that genetic pool going. Mm -hmm. And yet at the same time, maintain a garden in such a way that people think native plants are a good thing. Yes. That they don't look like a bunch of half dead plants half the year. And so I'm wondering, like at what point could you actually like cut them and hang them to dry? Or is that only possible with some species or does that not work at all? And one of the, the specific uh, ones I had is I had bluebell seeds that were given to me mm -hmm. from the wild, and I grew bluebells from them, and that went great. But I never could because I watered them, mm -hmm. you know, to keep them decent. Could like get a space where the seeds were dry enough to collect them, and so I'm struggling. There aren't a lot of places to find this kind of information. Yeah, no, and I mean that's we had a meeting a couple of weeks ago with a lot, a lot of seed banks, and just that realization that even within the banks and the professional world, there's so little communication often that this group of people will be doing germination testing with a species. And that information would have been really great over here and trying to increase that kind of information sharing. Um, I mean, it's hard with seeds. Some seeds you can take and ripen off. Um, I find that if you don't have a healthy embryo, so if you cut them in half and you see that nice little healthy embryo, um, if you don't have that, you're probably not going to get beyond with most species. That being said, I know people who have had like the best orchid germination that they've ever found with seeds that are like, we would consider way, way underripe. So it's, it's species dependent. And yeah, good resources are hard to find, really, really hard to find. I do a lot of scouring and a lot of like, this was somebody doing something for medical, but they did kind of the process that I wanted to do in the beginning of their article. So I'm going to use their methods and yeah. 
not always looking where you would expect to look. Stop. Any other questions? Thank you very much. Thank you.